Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. My vision started slowly going from a gray foggy and oh my goodness, I was so afraid and even talking about it with you, Joe, it makes me really scared. Hello and welcome to Talking Head Pain. I'm Joe Coe, Director of Education and Digital Strategy at the Global Healthy Living Foundation. And I've lived with migraine for over 20 years. I'm here today with Winnie Lynn. She's a physical therapist assistant and an amazing migraine Instagram content creator. I've been following her Instagram healing with chronic migraine now for a little bit, and it's a really inspiring platform. So I'm so happy that you're here today with us, Winnie Lynn. How are you feeling? I'm hanging in there. How are you doing? Uh, you know, it's it's one of those days where you have that like low nagging, like threatening of a migraine, but it's not quite there, but it, it's just enough to remind you that you have this. So mostly good, really happy that we're talking. And I think that I'll feel better after this discussion than I did before it. So with that said, can you walk us through your worst migraine attack? What did it feel like? What went through your head? So my worst migraine attack actually was the reason why I decided to seek medical attention. I was actually uh, meeting up with a friend that day and probably that previous week or a couple of days before that, I wasn't taking good care of myself. I wasn't getting enough sleep. Um, I, my anxiety and stress levels were pretty high. That day or that morning, I didn't eat. And the weather was constantly changing that day. And I was like, you know what? I'm still going to go to this uh, meetup with a friend this morning, just grab some coffee and see how it goes. And this was in May 2020. So, you know, everything was closed and the global pandemic was extremely, you know, just changing everybody's lives. And we were just trying to go with the flow with everything changing. Right. So I met with a friend. I finally went home. <laughs> because we were not allowed to use the restroom. <laughs> Everything's closed. And then I just remember my ear clogging. And then slowly I was in the kitchen standing, doing whatever I was doing. And my vision slowly, you know, my vision started slowly going from a gray foggy from my visual field. My visual field basically started to fill in with the, the um, image of cloudiness. And oh my goodness, I was so afraid and even talking about it with you, Joe, it makes me really, you know, scared and like reminiscing that time because I thought, am I going to lose consciousness? What's going on? This is my vision, you know? So immediately I was like, okay, I need to somehow get from the kitchen to my bedroom. And luckily I was using, you know, compensatory strategies. I was using my hands and trying to walk along the walls to kind of feel because my vision was slowly going away with this image of gray cloudy. Somehow I was able to get from the kitchen to the bedroom and I asked my mom, can I get the blood pressure cuff? And everything was normal. And then I remember regaining my visual field back and I just felt like I had the worst hangover ever. I felt so drained, so fatigued, and my pain level, if I could remember, it was probably at the high eight out of 10. So I was definitely in the red zone. I was completely wiped out for the rest of the day. I couldn't do anything at all. To better understand what's happening to us during a migraine hangover, I turned to Dr. Peter McAllister. We used to think, and many people still think of migraine as the pain, but really the pain is just the middle of it. In fact, as your audience probably knows, some people have migraine without ever having the pain of migraine. So migraine is a disorder that begins in the central nervous system. It then turns on pain nerves around the head, and then it goes back into the central nervous system. It starts with the prodrome in which you feel a bit off, you're kind of tired, you're not as sharp, then the pain comes, the nausea, et cetera. But a big phase of it that can last 12 hours to three days is this post drone, this hangover, this washed out feeling crummy sensation. That's still the migraine. It's still going on. You're having cognitive issues. It's just that it's back in the central nervous system. It's outside the brain because the brain doesn't feel a thing. The brain is insensate. So all of the pain that we feel in migraine comes from pain nerves around the scalp and in the meninges and the eyes and the nose, et cetera. When it goes back into the brain, that's when you have the hangover. Many of my patients say the pain's pretty bad, but it's this 
washed out, tired, cognitively slow feeling, that's the biggest thing that disables me from being able to work. We think that jumping on one of the good acute medications early in the cycle of that migraine can not only take away the light and sound sensitivity, the nausea and the pain, that's what they're proved to do, but they probably shorten that hangover. So you should work with your doctor to find the right acute migraine med, not just because you want your pain gone, but hopefully you wanna shorten that really crummy post-drome or hangover afterward. Hangover feeling is something that I can totally relate to. And I sometimes have explained it to friends and others as like the hangover without the fun the night before. I remember losing my words once and I was trying to order coffee and I just told them I was hungover because I felt like that was more socially acceptable than trying to explain <laughs> migraine attack. But um, totally relate to that. And that's so scary, this division implication and you're fortunate that you have some training that you were able to know to use your hands to feel the wall and that you checked your blood pressure and and all those things i want to pivot to how you took this negative and made it a positive you created an instagram account healing underscore w underscore chronic migraine to explore your journey with migraine what made you do that and what have been some of the most valuable lessons you've learned while you've been producing this content? I think my main reasons or my top two reasons, because there's so many reasons I can list, but number one was to have somebody that understands me, that gets it. Because explaining migraine and my migraine journey, it just, it takes a while. You need, I don't know how many days, but it's beautiful to be part of a community that just understands you, even though our journeys are so different, they just, they just get it. And I think that's amazing. So number one is to connect and have support. And number two is really raise awareness because I feel like there's such a big stigma with migraine and chronic migraine. It's because we don't talk about it a lot. Like people are just thinking like, oh, disease, she has a disease. They want to steer away there. It's not, you know, quote unquote attractive, but I feel like if we want really want to break the stigma, I'm going to talk about it. I love the way you talk about it. <laughs> I'm sure putting yourself out there, you've gotten some really absurd recommendations or comments. What are some of the most absurd quote unquote treatments or cures that people have slid into your DM with? Um, you know, surprisingly, not that many. If I could remember, probably trying some essential oils. <laughs> I just posted a picture of an attack and like I got six different comments around like different and I'm like I do this for a living like I have a podcast called talking head pain I talk to really smart people about it but essential oils was one of them and uh, another one was I don't know if you've tried this but some baking soda and lemon this is what this friend sent to me and I was like I'm so glad that worked for your friend and that's how I respond to people I'm glad that worked for you or I'm glad that you know, you sell essential oils and this is your side hustle. I'm not partaking, but so I'm surprised that you didn't get more of that. Maybe people just want me to try all the weird things. And now I do remember one, cause yeah, it's, it's not very common, at least people on Instagram, maybe in like, in, you know, real life people will, will say something random and I just can't remember at the, at this time, but yoga for sure on Instagram, people have mentioned like, oh, try yoga. It helps with everything. So when you were first diagnosed, how did you function at work? When I was diagnosed in 2020 with chronic migraine, I honestly didn't know much about chronic migraine and how debilitating it truly is for each individual like, uniquely, right? So I was naively still working full-time as a PTA. And as PTA, we are always on our feet working with patients with so many high complexity to low complexity, you know, diagnosis. So that required a lot of energy and nonstop working. So it wasn't really a friendly migraine environment. So I really surprised myself, like thinking back at the time, how I was able to work a little bit longer after I was diagnosed, but it did 
slowly started to creep on me and I needed time off. So I had to communicate with my boss at the time that I need time off for doctor's appointments to figure out what's going on with me. Is this the chronic migraine or a different other diagnosis that I need to figure out what's going on with my body? Because it wasn't just chronic migraine I was dealing with. I was dealing with more health issues at the time at uh, 2020. And luckily with my job, it's I'm really grateful that it's somewhat flexible because when I do need to have a weekday to take off for doctor's appointments, if necessary, I was able to work the weekends to make up for it. Was it inconvenient? Was it, did I feel guilty? Yes. It was really hard because, you know, when you're young and you're used to being in control of your body, it just takes yourself into emotional toll like what's going on like can I not perform am I less of a person now that I have some sort of disability it was a lot going on in year 2020. How have you come to embrace the reality of being a young person with a chronic disease and or redefine control? I think for me, I just had to accept it. I just had this perception of, oh, I'm a young person. I'm so used to being control. I've been pretty quote unquote healthy for quite a while. So I had to really think about just accepting my reality now. And how about in 2022 at your current job? How has navigating migraine been as a physical therapist assistant now? I'm lucky that all the bosses that I work under currently now, they themselves have had chronic migraine or migraine symptoms themselves, or they know somebody, a friend or a family that has dealt with it. So they are really aware of how debilitating it can be. So that that was a great step to communicating with them since they are aware of that. And right now I'm still working on the best treatment plan to manage my chronic migraine. And I'm only working on the weekends right now. Really interesting. I've been bumping into a lot of physical therapists or physical therapy, and it's a fascinating field. Has there been anything that you've learned in that field that the migraine community should know? I feel like what the migraine community should know about physical therapy is we are really there to improve your quality of life and really try to figure out what's meaningful for you and try to focus on that and use that as part of a way to gear the treatments. Like it doesn't have to be always exercise. It could be functional mobility in order for you to, you know, stand longer at the sink, stand longer doing whatever you love to do, gardening. If there's any activities that you love to do, tell your physical therapist, tell your occupational therapist, and they can just really focus on that activity. Because that's the reason why I love this field is because we're really looking at quality of life and try to figure out ways for you to live each day fully and not let your, you know, disabilities try to not let that control your life, try to coexist with your disabilities. Yeah, that's a really good point, coexisting with your disability. Have you ever gotten a migraine attack while being at work? Oh, yes. Yeah. So actually in year 2020, when I was still figuring things out, I realized that I would get visual auras once a month at least. And I was not a spoonie yet. <laughs> I was still able to, you know, complete my caseload, do all my documentation. And then suddenly when I'm overexerting myself and when I'm overwhelmed and I'm just like, because where I work is a long-term facility. That's my main setting, which is the inpatient setting, the geriatric population. And it's overly like there's sensory overload everywhere. So I didn't know that. I didn't know that my brain is hypersensitive. That's what I've chronic migraine is, is having a hypersensitive brain. So I honestly would be the, <laughs> the coworker that needed to lay down on the rehab mat at least once a month and kind of closer to, you know, going into 2020. So luckily I still had the energy to work and complete my job, but it was really the visual aura that really was debilitating and I had to stop whatever I was doing and lay down. As Winnie Lynn talks about, there are certain ways we can handle getting a migraine while at work. I asked Dr. McAllister to share some tips on what we should do if we get a migraine attack while working. 
Well, you know, it depends on their job. Clearly, if they're operating heavy machinery, they should likely refrain. If you have an office-based job, I think that you should find the drug that is the most helpful for knocking out the pain and other symptoms with the least amount of side effects, because really you want to be able to return to functionality. And whether that's, I have a patient who walks to the men's room and does a sumatriptan shot in the thigh, and 20 minutes can return to work. I have some who can take one of the new CGRP drugs, the pills, and uh, rest for 20, 30 minutes and return to work. If you can control your symptoms, you should continue on with your day because, you know, one of the biggest problems with migraine, a disorder that's not deadly, is that it's so disabling. And if you lose enough days from work, it's not going to look favorably upon you uh, at, at review time. So I had a patient who would take a nasal spray that worked great on the migraine, but they had to sleep three hours. That would be a bad idea in the office. That goes back to, Joe, why we have a migraine toolkit, because there might be a medicine you take in the evening when you're home that knocks out your headache and helps you sleep. But during the day, you want the one with the least amount of side effects that returns you to functionality as soon as possible. How has finding the right migraine treatments changed and or improved your life? I would say that finding the right migraine treatment helped me significantly because it allows me to be more independent. And I think, you know, when you're in your 30s, you're expected to take care of your loved ones. You know, society's expectations of you are high at that time. It allows me to at least kind of focus on the things that make me happy. I think I realized you know, kind of the reason why I called it healing underscore W with chronic migraine is that it's not only a migraine account, it's so much more than that to me, at least. Chronic migraine gave birth to so many things that I was doing wrong with my health. May it be physically neglecting myself or mentally, emotionally, not listening to my body when I need to listen to my body. So it's been, it's more of like a holistic approach for me. I feel like my journey is still beginning. Fascinating. The idea of migraine giving birth to this wellness journey. And that's a gift that this horrible chronic disease gave you and a gift that you're sharing with so many people, which is amazing. I want to circle back and talk a little bit more about the Instagram account. What are some of your favorite pieces of content that you developed? Can you describe them to us? I really like creating content that are obviously are relatable, but at the same time, I just remember, you know, when I was working full time and after work, I'm completely exhausted. If I'm going to go on Instagram, I want something entertaining. And that's just my opinion. I didn't really gravitate when I would look on my app to the information that were like long written posts, like, cause I'm, my brain is exhausted after work. So if I want to, you know, target the general population and increase awareness of how debilitating chronic migraine is, I really want to use my account to capture and captivate that attention first, and then also use the knowledge that I have and educate them. So I'm basically here to entertain and also educate the general population along with, you know, connecting with the community. I love that. That's what social media should be used for. What would you tell people that are listening today to do to advocate with their health care providers? What I personally do is I always try to come prepared. It's better to be overly prepared versus, you know, not preparing anything at all. I, I personally just write everything, all the points I want to talk about and even, you know, provide a list. And I know how it feels, <laughs> how it feels for, you know, a healthcare provider to come in and go out like, wait, I still have more to say. So I think what I've been hearing too, is it's, it helps when you have somebody else with you. So you guys can both advocate, but I personally try to show them that I'm coming from a place that is calm and I'm trying to be as professional as possible. So I'm trying to like create that vibe that I'm not going to be like, this isn't my problem. Because I think people shut down when they hear so much information at a time. So I try to create that environment, a friendly environment and be like, okay, so these are my symptoms. What are your thoughts? I never try to sound too demanding, but I kind of like say, this is what I'm dealing with. What are your thoughts? So I make sure I have a list and then I also try to ask them what their thoughts are from what I brought to them at the office. 
I think it's a really great approach that a lot of us can learn from with healthcare providers to view it as a team and to go in and think of it as almost a meeting, like you're preparing for a meeting and you're bringing the materials that you need for that meeting and that discussion. And you're talking almost like colleagues, which I think is really important. There's a concept called shared decision-making. So it's that you, and you know this being in the healthcare field where the healthcare provider and the patient come up to the decision together. And by you asking, what do you think about this? That creates that shift in paradigm that makes it easier for the healthcare provider who should be doing this anyway, but mm -hmm. it provides them more opportunity to do it. And I think that that's, um, we need every advantage we can get when we're dealing with a chronic disease. So I like those tips. I appreciate your time today. It was amazing. And the energy that you give to our community is beautiful. And thank you for spending this time with me on Talking Head Pain. And thank you so much for letting me have a voice and asking me to be a guest speaker here. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Talking Head Pain, the podcast that confronts head pain head on. If you like this episode, please give it an honest five-star rating and subscribe so you never miss another one. I'm Joe Co, and I will see you next time. This season of Talking Head Pain was made possible with support from Amgen, a sponsor of the Global Healthy Living Foundation. Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network.